evening is what is a libertarian? That is certainly a subject about which there are at least as many opinions as there are libertarians, possibly more. The genesis of this debate is a little interesting, actually, because given that the two opponents here, Mr. Poole and Mr. Konkin, are both editors, and in the case of Sam at least, publishers of libertarian periodicals, both of which have been less inclined over the years to use the term libertarian for different reasons, of course. It's considered by, <clears throat> by some at least a little bit ironic that these two people should be disputing the question of what is libertarianism. But anyone who has followed the careers of either or both is certainly well aware that there will be a lot of sparks struck up here tonight. In fact, for those of you, and I suppose there are very few, who are not familiar with either or both of these gentlemen, I would like to get them to at least stand up before they come up here to make their formal presentation so you can see who the combatants are tonight. And in this, well, it's not a corner exactly, but here's Sam from Long Beach. <laughs> Weighing slightly less than the battleship New Jersey, which is fortunate because he's being encroached upon by the Navy, so I'm told. So all of you are clear on who the combatants are. It's simply necessary to get them up here now and to inform you a little bit more about who they are. And now, <clears throat> Mr. Poole's distinguished opponent, Samuel Edward Conkin, or SEK3 as he likes to abbreviate himself. Sam is, has an interesting history in libertarianism, considering what he was telling me a little earlier about being progressively invaded at the Anarcho Village by the US Navy. He's probably not going to like this metaphor too much, but he reminds me a little bit of the character of Pug Henry in The Winds of War. This was a gentleman who, in a work of fiction to be sure, seemed to have an uncanny knack for being where important things were going on at any given point. Sometimes he was front and center, sometimes he was metaphorically waving from the back of the convertible, but he was there. And Sam, I think, if one was to trace his history and activities over the last 17 or 18 years of what we can refer to as the modern libertarian epoch, has a somewhat similar history. He's been around. Ugly rumors have it that he even had something to do with the foundation of the Free Libertarian Party of New York. At present, he is the guiding force behind the movement of the libertarian left, the editor-publisher of New Libertarian, and what I guess I would describe as the movement's foremost freelance gadfly. Up here to tell it like it is, let me present for your delectation, Samuel Edward Conkin III. Well, thanks and laissez-faire. I, uh, <clears throat> as usual, get get the stra stranger introductions, but uh, stranger people here. Bob, Bob, I think I should start off with explaining why there's a debate, since it really didn't, I think, come across from the first two speakers, and indeed it was uh, a result from a conspiracy of Dagny and myself. Uh, although, as usual, as most of these conspiracies, uh, for those of you who are conspiracy buffs, can uh, tell. It generally happens when people sit around, have a couple beers, and say, well, what if we did this, and I don't know, maybe that'll happen, and uh, <clears throat> pretty soon, uh, like, like Adam Smith's merchants, we fix prices. In this case, it was um, a, uh, something I'd noted, a peculiar symmetry, which I, perhaps because of, uh, like Bob Poole, I have a scientific background. I was a uh, quantum mechanic. If you had a quantum, I'd fix it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Crawl underneath, get greasy from the quarks, you know. Anyway, uh, it occurred to me that he and I, in, in a very symmetrical but antithetical sense, have, have evolved in, in, in a sense away from uh, the word. At the same time, we were berating him for, uh, or actually just after I'd noticed he was uh, uh, fading out from using the term libertarian in his paper, uh, we yet somebody pointed out the same issue. We've been complaining about how the word is being corrupted in uh, New Libertarian number 12. So uh, while uh, he said, so for those of you who are somewhat new to the movement, I might add that um, we, we're kind of like bookends, if you want, with uh, Dr. Rothbard here in the middle. We, we might be said to define the libertarian spectrum. Uh, from I'm sure uh, uh, Bob can add to this and later in his, in his uh, copious rebuttal time, but uh, he is kind of, uh, I, from my point of view, he sort of sits on the, on the uh, sharp edge of the far right of the movement, kind of teetering back and forth, deciding whether or not he wants to fall off. Uh, and then later in this discussion, I'll probably point out a couple of uh, strong gusts of historical winds that are blowing in this year of 1985, which may, uh, may send him going with, with hurricane force, uh, uh, most, rather than keeping total suspense, uh, most importantly, the onset of major warfare in our time. 
Uh, so anyway, that's, that's the basis of this debate. So I think uh, it's poorly worded, of course. It should be resolved that a libertarian has you know, seven, seven tentacles and green hair, and then one person would, would, would defend it, and the other person would point out that they hadn't seen any tentacles in the first one by a great rhetorical force would, would uh, show that, that the question of the actual number of tentacles is irrelevant and win the debate. Uh, that's not what we're doing here, but I think it's, it's the, the, the importance of the point comes about from, from this. Consider the following fact that if, he, uh, if, his, move, if his magazine uh, is, is still considered uh, to have some relation to this thing we call the libertarian movement, then it would certainly have the largest circulation. And if it isn't, then New Libertarian does. Uh, it is kind of, again, ironic and strange and something we, in a, in a weird sense, hold in common that both of us feel very uncomfortable with this, this word, uh, at least in our publications. Well, I'm afraid, as certainly after hearing the first part, which I'm uh, technically not supposed to go right into rebuttal on, uh, I think that the, you're going to get the impression, if you haven't already, that the uh, reasons for our uneasiness are vastly different. Uh, standing here in front of a room full of large probably of people who largely feel semi-comfortable with the term libertarian or, which is a very important distinction you'll get in a minute, once felt very comfortable with the label libertarian. Um, I noticed Bob having no inhibition whatsoever in uh, utilizing the terminology. Um, I gather that he sees, shall we say, he perceives the market for his magazine somewhat different from, uh, from what uh, we have here in this room as a serving the marketplace. Okay, uh, that's, that's pretty much the setup. Now here is, I guess, where we have to go into the following things. What is a libertarian? Well, the standard definition that we used for many years, besides things like libertarian speak with forked tongue, because we used to use one side of our mouth for speaking to liberals and the other side for speaking conservatives and changing our rhetoric accordingly. It certainly was, Jeff, Jeff remembers it well, I can see. <laughs> Perhaps he's still using, he's still doing it, right? Uh, in the, it, it covers a multitude of sins. It covers a uh, large group. In fact, while in 1969 it could be considered, I would say, recognizable faction or um, tight uh, splinter, perhaps not all of us marching under, uh, under close order discipline control from Murray and Carl at the uh, St. Louis Yaf Convention, uh, I would say that it, it was considered something, something solid, something unified, something homogeneous to a, to a certain extent. It wasn't true then. It wasn't true in 1969, but it appeared that way at least. And certainly to those of us who were just getting into it, which I think Bob and I were both are, fall, fell over the brink into libertarianism about the same time, whether or not we both fall from our different directions out of it. Uh, this is recognizably no longer the case. In fact, uh, since he, he was so kind to spend 20 minutes building up the case for me, I would like to point out that most of what he pointed out, or what he was listing there, is a strong indication of part of the problem that we, and I'm going to use the word now, agorists, uh, find with the term libertarian. Uh, you know, when we run across uh, Murray and Carl back in the, uh, in the beginning, in the beginning to be September 69, if uh, Sharon Presley is here, she can bring up 1964 a little later. But uh, in the meantime, and of course Murray can always bring up 1950 when he invented it. Uh, the movement directly. So, uh, but in, for most of us, for large numbers, population, market forces, we're talking about here, and uh, that's that's part of the definition. It started in in uh, around 1969. There was a, uh, a feeling of radicalness, of pureness, of hardcoreness, of let's go out and get them. Now, the definition, as I said at one point, was uh, anything you wanted. Uh, by 1971, as a matter of fact, uh, the term uh, semi-cynically was there are two definitions, two standard definitions of libertarian, regardless of all of the uh, Randian rhetoric or all the other rhetoric you hear. The first definition of libertarian is anybody who calls himself one. Definition number two, anybody who agrees with me. Now, you'll notice that each of these serve totally different functions. When you want to go tell the world how, uh, how hardcore you are, or how many people you are, I mean, and uh, that you're a massive force, and of course in the 69, 71, in the post-New Left period, we were worried about masses. Uh, inertia didn't bother us, but mass did, for the scientists here. Uh, so we worried about large, getting these large numbers, these masses together, and uh, so therefore, anybody ever used the word libertarian, we'd hug to our breasts. I was mentioning to somebody a few, an hour ago, that uh, when Edith Efron used the word, the, L, the big L word, in T, and TV Guide, the biggest circulation magazine in the English language, we immediately cheered. We were here, we were real, we existed. Our word was, was now appearing in, in uh, TV Guide, and about a year later, the editor said, 
Um, well, you know, we're not all conservatives here. We give other sides equal time, you know, liberal so-and-so and libertarian Edith Efron. So now we were a third force. I mean, our poor, nothing was going to stop us. We were going bigger and bigger. Okay. The other definition was, of course, every time we have a disagreement with each other. And whenever there is a conflict or a disagreement, we have the, the second formula comes into play. Anybody who agrees with me, anybody who doesn't, obviously not a libertarian, there's something else. Uh, we either read them out of the movement or we put hyphens in front of them and, 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 and add a secondary effect. Now, both of these functions have their purpose. And uh, it's part of the problem of politics, or including anti-politics and reaching people in general, of selling concepts that we want to have both of these things on our side. We want massiveness, we want large numbers, we want to uh, uh, attract people who want to be groupies, you know, and so forth, to so build up a group. But on the same side, we also want to be pure. We want to be hardcore. We want to have something there. As uh, one of the comic strip characters once said, looking down into uh, what was supposed to be the depths of somebody's soul, there's no there there. And uh, if libertarianism goes in the, all the way towards purely definition one, then what is it? Let's say we won Okay. Everybody in the world now called himself libertarian. Mao Zedong or his successor, Deng Xiaoping or whoever, was a, called himself libertarian. You know, this has already begun to happen in California. We, I can show cases where Ronald Reagan called himself a libertarian. Jerry Brown called himself a libertarian. Um, you know, I mean, we've gotten presidents uh, uh, who have now the, the, the L word in their past. And, and, and how far are we going to go? So everybody calls himself a libertarian. So definition one is, is fulfilled. We have libertarian fascists, libertarian uh, communists, you know, libertarian uh, mass executioners, libertarian you know, Mansonites or whatever, libertarian pacifists. And, and, uh, so we've won, right? Libertarian is now everywhere, and the word is accepted, and no problem, right? Libertarian government garbage collectors, uh, uh, whatever, libertarian. Uh, and of course, the, the ultimate nightmare, which I've described in a few pamphlets, for those few of you who don't remember it, the, the idea of a libertarian working his way through the system, who arrests one of us counter-economists, one of us people actually go and break laws and things, because we don't believe in the government. And uh, he takes us in front of a libertarian who works his way through the system as a judge. And he takes us in front of a libertarian, you know, he sentences us, and a libertarian working his way through the bail takes us to the jail where a libertarian working his way through the system as a turnkey uh, holds us prisoner until eventually the libertarian working his way through the system as the court uh, or the prison uh, priest that brings us up to the, uh, the, the electric chair where a libertarian working his way through the system as a state technician is making sure it's in good working order. And a uh, libertarian working his way through the system as a burly guard slaps us down on the chair, and another libertarian working his way through the system as an executioner throws a switch and, and uh, wipes out the, the one person who was, in fact, a libertarian not working his way through the system. <laughs> this is, therefore, I think, the distinction that I'm trying to draw. Now, Bob probably made a few good points. I thought, uh, even in, uh, as visibly as I was trying to write them down, uh, on the, pos the problems of what happens if you try, perhaps, to go too far the other way, if there's another way, in the sense of uh, a purity of, uh, of ideology uh, so distilled that only one person can hold it and he's not sure about himself. You know, the ultimate schizophrenia, who shall watch the watcher? Obviously, you, you know, bisect the lobes and uh, get a, a severe case of, uh, of split personality so you can uh, guard, guard yourself of, of, of purity. Uh, even, even not going that far, there is a problem of maintaining the, uh, the body pure, the body poli politic, or in this case, the body anti-politic, to a great degree of purity. Um, uh, esteemed and uh, extremely good friend Dr. Rothbard here, who I uh, uh, could not praise enough for, for his accomplishments, tends to attract uh, uh, people uh, probably attracted by his purity to him, and um, uh, they then form groups and call labels and, and have uh, an amazing record, a ama uh, truly entertaining record of, of schism and, and splitting er uh, ever, ever more thereafter. I have recorded much of, of those conversations in my, uh, in my journals, and uh, without them, the entertainment content of New Libertarian would have suffered greatly. Uh, I don't think it's entirely, uh, I, in fact, I wouldn't say at this point, I'm not, not, not to be a libertarian pope myself and, and grant absolutions here, but it is, it is not so much Murray's fault at all that this kind of thing happens. I think there's a basis involved in the whole concept, the idea concept, and methods of maintaining it. Uh, the purity that Murray fights for is valuable and uh, is, is, is absolutely essential because regardless of whatever else happens and, and, uh, and wherever else people wander on the spectrum, at least he's making sure there's a there there. But that if, if he wins, much as we dis disagree with him on, on uh, certain strategic issues, at least I do, we know that if Murray wins, there's some there there. Now, I happen to think that if, if, if quote, he won, 
uh, Murray would, would be rounded up by the very person that he helped get into the Libertarian Party uh, FBI directorship would probably come around and pick him up within a day. And uh, I don't think he entirely disagrees with me since I'm sure he had Ed Crane on the list about 10 years ago, uh, back, back when Ed was a good guy, right? So it's, 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 it's an endemic problem. And okay, so we, we've kind of defined here a large spectrum of things. What do we want? Well, I think we want purity. But, but the problem is we've got to have a lot of disagreement about that. There's no, uh, no uh, way around that. I think, however, that the third method that some of the people, and I'm going to only mention them in passing, uh, for those of you who want to check it out more or ask me about Libertarian Connection, uh, neither Bob or I are into them at the moment, so it's not a big issue. But there are, simply, there are a lot of people who take a position of total live and let live and say, well, all ideologies, or as uh, Bob once said, probably not meaning uh, quite what I'm saying here, let a hundred flowers bloom, implying that all Libertarian roads lead equally to the result that we want. Okay. This is also not true. Some people are simply wrong. And it's worth pointing it out. Uh, if, as I made, I made the uh, the long uh, description about libertarians working their way into, through the system to accomplish certain ends and uh, ending up essentially executing the few people who are not working within the system and achieving some libertarianism in real life. Well, that is clearly a wrong road that those uh, working in the system people took. Okay, there are many of those cases, and they, they, they deserve to be pointed out. They should be pointed out. And probably for the rebuttal time and most of the rest of this debate, I will... Um, uh, be in that position of doing so. I would like everyone to remember, especially in the question period, right before you totally gang bang up on me uh, for uh, doing what, what I may have seen, appeared to accuse others of doing. In the second page, or on the third now, we've, we've grown, in New Libertarian Magazine, I have carried a slogan which has mutated slightly for grammatical reasons, but essentially it's always said something to the effect of, everybody appearing in this publication disagrees. Okay, that it, to me is a profoundly libertarian statement. It does not say that they disagree correctly or properly or that everybody's opinion is equally worth anything. It's a statement essentially that they all have equal access to the market. So from my point of view, the question of libertarianism and what is a libertarian and how do we, and more importantly, the hidden question there is how do we make the decision, who does the choosing, and how do we select for that, is entirely left to the market. I get up and say it. I got an editorial page. Other people come and print in my uh, magazine. I actively seek people who I think uh, will outrage some of the readers and, and I think are totally and utterly wrong. And some cases that they don't, they don't get a chance to uh, appear at all. But in fact, that is the answer. I, I believe in purity as, as, as least as much as Murray does and uh, I'm sure several other people here. But on no circumstances should the mechanism of it leave what we believe is, is basic, the marketplace itself. The market decides. Let the market decide is, is a great libertarian slogan. It's our, if one, the one thing close to unanimous agreement we have on anything that deals to do with human action. Let the market decide. Okay, now, one last caveat on that, of course, is let the market decide should not mean let's sit back and let the market decide. The market is a sum of individual action. Those individuals are entrepreneurs. Uh, Murray and I have disagreed a little bit about whether or not entrepreneurs are born or made. Uh, if they are indeed born, which I don't agree, I'm sure genetic reengineering could, could help us considerably on that. But uh, uh, I think they're made in one sense or another, or they could be made the rest of the way. The entrepreneurial component of each individual, remembering from our Mises that we are all workers, entrepreneurs, and, and capitalists to some extent in varying degrees, uh, can, be, can be emphasized, can be uh, grown. And in a sense, there's always an entrepreneurial component of all of our lives unless we become total dependents, total robots, that always exists and, and, um, to some or greater or lesser degree. Okay, having said all this, having put all these caveats down, having uh, shown hopefully with great forcefulness, and then you can walk into the literature table anytime and see uh, uh, a great variety on our table alone, I think I've finally come to the point where I am now ready to um, be properly understood when I choose to solidly and thoroughly disagree with almost everything the previous speaker said. The problem is he has appealed to and given us a long list of what appear to be libertarian contributions. Let me offer a competing system, a competing way of looking at things, shall we say, of, of viewing things, which perhaps make these wonderful uh, gains um, put them in a little more sinister light. Suppose, in fact, we take the, the position that libertarianism does have something to do with liberty, does in fact mean that we are for liberty, and we take the insight from Dr. Rothbard and many others that the liberty itself is, is antithetical to an institution known as a state. Now, it's not necessarily the case, it doesn't have to be the case, that only the state trammels upon liberty. 
uh, we, can, we can imagine or we can perceive several other such entities uh, existing around us. But we do know two things from any empirical study whatsoever. One is that the state is the enemy. It is the largest one that exists in this time and that we were likely to see for quite a while. And it dwarfs all others uh, massively. This is the threat. Okay, if this is the threat to liberty and the state is pure coercion, it has no function of, li of defending liberties whatsoever, and this again is a position that most libertarians hold, then we must ask ourselves the following thing. If certain uh, agents of this entity, whether or not directly, internally, within its, in the belly of the beast, its actual tentacles, or its support mechanisms, its uh, foundations and institutes, which of course it supports and nurtures carefully through a system of uh, tax deductions, carefully selected, uh, suddenly begin to pick up certain minor things in rhetoric uh, that we've associated with libertarianism does not our suspicion arouse. If our enemy starts using some of our terms or starts uh, attempting to appear in our guise, for example, say libertarians wore, uh, all wore uh, uh, green bow ties except, uh, well, even the females, what the hell, we're unisexual now. Everybody's wearing green bow ties. The bow ties, of course, came from Murray and uh, the greens are the the, the far-off kook wing, shall we say, on the other side and a great uh, a uh, gesture of solidarity, the green bow tie was defined as a unanimous symbol of libertarianism. Well, the next day we, uh, we suddenly find a few government officials start wearing green, uh, green bow ties and, and, and uh, when they come, maybe an IRS agent knocks on the door and we see one wearing a green bow tie, we're, our guard is lowered a bit. Maybe, uh, well, geez, this guy's wearing the libertarian symbol. Maybe he's not such a bad IRS agent. And when we're sitting there smoking our dope and the, the axe comes through crashing through the door and they come kicking in and run in and, uh, you know, oh, wait a minute, one of the guys who's busily throwing the handcuffs on us and slamming against the walls wearing a green bow tie. Things have improved. We are now, you know, it's a little more, they're libertarian narcs, you know, they're, they're not so bad. We're, we're, the system's getting a lot better. And uh, then we get dragged up and, uh, hey, we're probably going to get a good sentence this time. The judge is wearing a green bow tie. No sweat. He only gave us 20 years. We know, of course, that somebody who wasn't wearing the green bow tie would have given us 35 or 40 or whatever, maybe you had a shot in sight. So we're obviously better off under the regime of the green bow tie. Okay, what has happened, of course, has happened. What I'm talking about is no fantasy. The use of, of the corruption of political labels is a historic fact since the day the first political label arose. Any of you who have had the barest history of political science, of, of any political history know that the words liberal, the word Whig, the word Whig originally meant horse thief, interesting enough, which is much hard, more hardcore from a libertarian point of view than what they eventually became. But the, the Whigs, the liberals, what, what does liberalism mean now? I mean, some of you know that it meant something not too far from uh, Mr. Poole's uh, esteemed position and in fact was pretty good for its time. Anyway, uh, I'm going to be about to be cut off in time and I think uh, that a lot of what I'm going to say is probably much more um, uh, appropriate to the uh, rebuttal time. Uh, let me close on one thing. Whatever Mr. Poole chooses to do, I have a feeling that he and many of his friends and ilk are going to come to some hard problems of reality. The battle for symbolism, the battle for rhetoric, the battle for ideas, that's a, that's a touchy thing because ideas can both mean superficial statements and rhetoric of fact and they can also mean people like Richard Weaver say acting on them. Okay. I would say that if you watch this debate for, further on, watch out for the action. We can't go into great details about our various actions in the next 10 seconds, but watch for the action. Or as, as uh, one version of this, uh, Deep Throat always said, look for the money. That's the money, the action, that's going to distinguish him and I when things like war is declared and which one of us is going to, shall we say, find a libertarian way to defend our country, but perhaps with a little more restraint and drafting and, and taxation, and which of us are going to say things like, Let's sabotage the war machine. Let's run people in underground railroads out of the country, etc. Anyway, that's the debate. What is a libertarian? I think you've heard two interestingly uh, different versions of it, and uh, we'll continue it for your delectations to see uh, if you want to shop in somewhere in the marketplace where we've defined the boundaries. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Okay, Sam, in the last round of the regularly scheduled bout, you will have the last word. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, <clears throat> for fairness, I might add that uh, the original debate rules were, of course, to have positive, negative, negative, positive, so that Bob should have the last word. But since we're having question periods, I probably, or at least uh, those who feel favorable to him can figure out ways to ask questions in which he can get his last word. I certainly expected to have the same privilege if I had worked the other way. 
Um, there's actually a tremendous amount of specifics I would love to disagree with um, Bob on here. Uh, much of them go very deeply into or require a fairly deep uh, roots digging here concerning uh, why we disagree the way we do. Bob, uh, as far as I can tell, I'm sure he's evolved in certain things. We have, we have all sorts of similarities. It's really instructive how we, dis how we evolve since we're both big science fiction fans. I uh, sort of semi-discovered J uh, John J. Pierce who ran a section inside New Libertarian for a while. Um, dropped out when we read weekly and Bob uh, picked him up and ran him as a columnist. So we have a certain amount of uh, background in science and science fiction and so forth. And yet, uh, and, and at one time, perhaps in the uh, 60s, we may have been roughly in the same position. It is no longer the case. Um, I don't really see him, except now, he, now that he's quoting Mao Tse Tung and letting a hundred flowers bloom, which might be a sudden lurch to the left, I'll have to note in future, in future editorials. Uh, or, of course, from my point of view, since Mao Tse Tung would be far right the other way. But I really haven't seen, uh, and all due apologies, so perhaps again due to my position on the spectrum, uh, that much change in Bob's position in the last uh, 15 odd years. I think the rest of the movement, and here again we get into shady problems of definition. Uh, perhaps if there's one point where I agree with him about shades of gray, it is in describing a distribution uh, uh, curve or distribution graph of the libertarian movement because we do tend to stretch and shade out as we move along. Uh, some people move faster than others. I think there's a lot of, perhaps in fact we're talking about two different libertarian movements. This is also goes back to what is a libertarian and what are we using the terms as. And to put it bluntly, I consider what Bob Poole is doing is uh, becoming more and more like our uh, uh, not-so-friendly uh, economist, Milton Friedman, an efficiency expert for the state. And uh, I mean this in the following way, that every the state itself to exist cannot simply be totally rapacious on all grounds and all times and so forth, uh, grab, 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 confiscate, confiscate, steal, murder, etc. There's a certain amount of restraint required for it to maintain its mystique that it is serving some useful function to us. Uh, if it... Uh, if it was constantly murdering and raping and plundering and so forth, it would, it would have to restrain itself. Uh, it even gave up raping um, a whole century ago uh, when it abolished draw in Europe, at least in that form. The plundering has probably increased tremendously since taxation used to be 10%, but uh, after hundreds of years of classical liberalism and uh, gradualism that uh, some people have accused Bob of advocating, we now have 50% taxation in the uh, enlightened, more classically liberal parts of the world. So uh, perhaps there is a flaw in following this, uh, in explaining to the state how by restraining their appetite in certain uh, very uh, and well-chosen areas, we can make them more efficient and last longer. Maybe that's not what we want to do. Maybe we, in fact, want to get people out of the state. Uh, Siskai is an interesting question, and it, it's kind of weird because it almost reverses us here. Uh, Siskai, of course, is, is, is a totally unrecognized uh, pariah of the world. Uh, you would think that would be almost enough for it to... Um, to gain some sort of uh, uh, friend, you know, friendliness from libertarians, since we've all felt as outsiders, and yet uh, Bob was warning us not to, not to identify with outsiders and so forth. Well, this guy, of course, is 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 a sham to a large extent. It's got a kind of a perhaps free market in, um, action and within certain limited areas of the market, but in fact, it is a uh, large concentration camp for black people, so that they won't uh, mix around and threaten the uh, ill-gotten non-property owned territory in South Africa proper, land which was stolen by plunder and theft and who much of, much of the original owners remain there to counterclaim it. Um, therefore, I find this guy in the larger arena to, uh, to be anything but something a libertarian can find any value in. And having it recognized as a state, since I don't believe in states as many libertarians do, is hardly something for us to um, to leap forward to. I'm beginning to run out of time, I noticed, and I did want to hit the following. Two, two quickies here. Uh, uh, Bob brought up the, um, the baby boom generation. For what reason, I don't know, except that uh, he makes certain claims about their politics, which is ridiculous. Uh, you are part of the very bo baby boom generation, as am I. And by talking around to said people, I found a great lack of unanimity on politics uh, approaching that of the libertarian movement. Uh, there may be certain uh, averages appearing here and there in, in transitory passing, but frankly, I don't see it. Uh, there's a certain small segment of that baby boom generation I find particularly odious, called yuppies, which you might have run across my cover. Their, fact, their, their distinguishing characteristic is that they've given up their ideals. So that is what the term means, regardless of what marketing agents are busily trying to launder it up to mean today. 
Um, oh, and by the way, this is, of course, not yuppie. This is, unfortunately, Bob has been out of Southern California far too long. This is, of course, a punk outfit from, uh, from the factory in uh, well-known West Hollywood. I, that's my idea of dressing up. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, Dagny, who suggested I wear it, uh, thought that I would look too hippie and therefore uh, passe. Otherwise, I don't know. Anyway, I'm glad, I'm glad to see we're not degenerating to minor sartorial arguments in our, uh, in, our, in our big debate here. Can I point out, there's a couple of, one more thing I want to point out here in passing that, that it just struck me when I was taking notes of him that he was talking about the U.S. as an interfering force around the world. And in the United States, uh, the U.S. intervention, imperialism as the real word, or the word that those of us don't shrink from using, is, uh, he says, a consensus of, of supporting it is starting to crumble. Um, I think this kind of says it all. Uh, we undoubtedly move in two different worlds that are growing further and further apart. And whether or not they're the, uh, the same one or whether or not we have a validity here, the idea that anybody in 1985 can just begin to see the consensus around American imperialism begin to flake at the edges when in fact it shattered into a million pieces and by 1969 uh, <laughs> is totally overwhelms me with, with, uh, with a feeling of, of almost... Uh, if I had to wander in Bob Poole's institutional quarters for a while of being a stranger in a very strange land. I think, uh, hopefully, and, and I feel this, that most of the people who call themselves a libertarian movement up until today have felt a similar way, uh, would feel similar about such things, and in fact the movement has traveled along, perhaps not as fast as us, me in some cases, and perhaps hopefully even faster than me in others, but in fact we are getting further and further away from this type of reform the enemy, reform the establishment, reform the state, and Let's, you know, let, and wasting time on people with best interests. You see, there's one fact, and this is a perfect thing to close on, there's one fact that is absolutely essential to developing a libertarian strategy and understanding what we as consistent libertarians, pure types, are fighting for, and that is this. It comes from our Mises, it comes from Albert J. Nock, it comes from Murray Rothbard, who didn't want to stay around for this, and that is this, there are producers and there are parasites in our society. The economic means and the political means of making money, as Nock put it, and so forth. All of these things say the same thing. And the fact is the producers, in some sense, must always outnumber the parasites, or the parasite kills the host and all dies. Therefore, the producers have a vested interest in what we're doing. No, almost nobody that Bob Poole talks about, those bureaucrats, those institutionalists, those think tankers, are producers. They are parasites. And I, for one, have no desire to waste large and inordinate amount of money to convince the parasites on how to trim their operation. In the end, we are fighting for the producers. We are fighting for those great downtrodden who are not yuppies, who are not uh, bureaucrats, who are not civil servants, who don't think of themselves as some kind of amorphous uh, whatever, and in fact feel that they are being pushed around, kicked around, taxed to death, uh, their, their businesses uh, destroyed and so forth by the state. That is what I'm fighting for. Taxation is theft to these people. The draft is slavery to these people. And in fact, when it comes, push comes to shove and they get enlightened, they're going to go for radical solutions and not sit around and talk about 1% uh, cut this year uh, sales tax reform or whatever. And that's, I think, where we finally disagree. Thank you. Mm. How to summarize that, I guess it sounds like he wants to witness for Jesus, but he's not sure what the true faith is. And care to do a little walk down memory lane? Um, yeah, but it would take up a tremendous amount of time here. A I've, little, uh, little walk down memory lane. Both, both of us have been here for quite a while. I think uh, the first thing we should say is that if you want to get at least two different versions of it, why don't you check out our uh, respective publications, which are available in the Huckster's room. Uh, with luck, tomorrow I'll have some copies of Where Were You in 69, uh, and uh, nostalgia items uh, such as that. I did attempt to write a... Um, history of the libertarian movement, take what I call the cram history of the libertarian movement for a certain uh, Canadian publication with a certain person here who uh, sees eye to eye to me and all sorts of things nowadays at the time was involved with a, uh, an editor who decided to purge me from continuing it because I got closer and closer to the present because of a certain divergence, I guess, in our views of what was important in the libertarian movement. The reason I bring this up is I think that Bob and I would have very different histories. I think they would, in a sense, not even differ in the sense of establishment and revision as so much as what we consider important happened. Uh, my mention of the Libertarian Party, for example, as candidates would be extremely minor and in passing and pointing out how much time was wasted by certain people who were otherwise valuable. Uh, in, in being involved with them, and I would be discussing all sorts of interesting breakthroughs done by people developing counter-economic techniques, uh, publications, and so forth. I consider Mike Hoy's, for example, Loom Panic's uh, publications and dissemination to be one of the major libertarian breakthroughs in recent time. Um, Bob might forget to mention.
mention that. I don't know. Um, I'm sure he'll, he'll answer in a second or two. But I think it's uh, what I'm trying to say is that there's there, there, there's quite a distinction here, since you asked both of us, uh, of what is important and what the movement is like. We still have some kind of of marginally collective consciousness in the sense that we think there is a movement and so forth. I think there's a libertarian culture. Uh, this may may arise even more so in uh, an upcoming issue. And since Murray left here, I can say this now uh, without worrying about being jumped on. Uh, he, he's probably one of the main exponents of the of the statement that there isn't one. You, in a sense, uh, exhibit the fact that there was one even then, that you made certain amazing amount of life and cultural choices in the way you were going to choose to live, which, of course, is a cultural statement, not just a, a pure political one. And uh, I think this has evolved. And yes, you're right, the future or the present, in the sense, is much different than we predicted. And what it'll be like in another 20, 30 years will be, continue, will be different than probably either I or Bob extrapolates. And uh, in the meantime, uh, we're going to uh, keep taking sightings and uh, move towards what we think is the proper uh, target as, and make corrections, at least I do, um, as often as possible. It just occurred to me, because uh, but Bob just stimulated something in what he said. Uh, you're also in making a state uh, a assumption, which Bob kind of let you get uh, carried along with here, and that uh, the choices, either cutting everything off, dropping out, remaining, you know, sort of uh, sub subterranean or underground, versus being uh, working within the system, playing the game to a large extent, making all sorts of compromises or whatever, being active. In fact, that is not the choice, uh, as as I and, and several of the people who hang around me can attest, I break every law in the world. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a walking lawbreaker and uh, publicly tell everybody about it every time I get. I don't pay a dime in taxes. Uh, I uh, am you know, a legal alien who has, has gotten away with it for a decade with no sweat. And I get up in front of large uh, audiences of uh, people which are selected, yes, but selected because they're libertarian. And even if they're not counter-economists, whatever problems I may have with Bob, uh, he would obviously feel morally inhibited, uh, at least uh, as of until today, of turning me in. I don't know what it'll feel like tomorrow. But uh, I think that's, that's kind of one of the last pieces of glue that keep him and I and, 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 this, and, and others and, and everybody in between in the same movement. And I think that is an option that didn't exist uh, at your time uh, to a large extent because of prob partly because of conception of it and part, uh, it evolved and partly because of um, the fact that the movement as a culture, as an entity, as a society, as I perceive it, has become large enough to actually be able to sustain people like me being both productive, both being able to you know, be as productive or rich as we feel like working for it. I don't happen to feel like working for it as much as some do. And uh, uh, I can think of others like, say, Doug Casey, who is equally legal and uh, extremely rich and so forth, but um, that can do this and, uh, you know, essentially have our cake and eat it too. And that is the answer to all these super individualist uh, dropouts, not, not you by any means, I'm talking about people like the Connections, who argue that that, that is the only way out of this, to drop out totally. And... Uh, uh, to any kind of movementism of, of the, the smacks of collectivism and therefore being a libertarian. Uh-uh. There's a huge payoff for us. We can have our cake and eat it, too. Are you inviting us back? Oh, you're always welcome back in my, you have the, in my group. No, no sweat. Uh, may I make an analogy, which I hope you don't find too embarrassing, but you remind me a lot of the radical feminists who decided the only way they could at least temporarily serve their cause was to give up men and become hardcore lesbians. And uh, it seems to me your position on joining, uh, uh, you know, to, to, because of the time to be an individualist required so much out of you to sort of tear loose of society, that that seemed to be the only way to do it. I, I feel there's a connection there. And a lot of people, like a lot of these, these people who decide to become lesbians not as a, as a social or sexual choice, but as a purely political choice, which is, you know, before 1974 was almost incomprehensible, uh, I think uh, there's a certain case, uh, a, certain, a certain analogy involved there. Yes, I think. Uh, yeah, and uh, I, th I think it would be reasonable to take a few more questions here. Jeff, I think you had your hand up first way back when, d during our fall start. Jeff asks Sam whether he would consider the transition from a state which conscripts people to a state which does not conscript people to be forward progress, I guess would be a good phrase. 
Well, for those of you into uh, sciences and chemistry, I consider those degenerate states. So my answer is essentially there is no fundamental difference. Anybody who doesn't want to be conscripted can uh, join me any time in, uh, in the great counter-economy and thumb their nose at the state. Right now, uh, several, what, 40 percent or something of the draft uh, registration eligible use have decided they'd rather live in a society in which the state uh, is not successfully conscripting or registering people to be conscripted, and they're living it right now, regardless of the state's wishes. That, to me, is an important is is what what in fact we want. The transition state from a state that has one position, official position on conscription, versus a state that has another official position on conscription, really doesn't uh, attract me as any way to devote energy to have it jump over that. <laughs> that energy barrier from one to the other. So my answer is, if you want it down to the line, is it's not worth the effort to change from one to the other. The answer is to get out of a system which has a state. How, how far are you willing to push this? Is it not worth the effort to um, move from a state that has concentration camps to a state that has people um, to one to the other? Is that relevant? Okay, I'll, I'll answer it in, in a larger sense here, because I think we're, we're, we're moving more and more from the political now, I think, towards the individual choice issue. If I lived in an area which was claimed by a state that singled out people that wore, uh, shall we say, suede black leather ties at times, or golden apple tie pins for discordian purposes, um, and I, being you know, on the special hit list and there were a lot of people in society who wanted to be good, 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 patriotic, whatever, whatever ians, and uh, were hunting me, I would probably move from that state to a place where I could get away with a lot more and, and the populace was a lot more with me. Okay? So for example, if I was a, um, uh, if I'm having a draft evasion, I'm not going to hang out in Arkansas, God forbid, <laughs> poor, poor Paul, but uh, Los Angeles would be a great place to, right, to live. Uh, similarly, if I was uh, Gypsy or Jewish, uh, I would not hang around in, um, in Germany between 1933 and 1945. On the other hand, uh, if I can imagine several cases in which probably I wouldn't uh, notice, uh, you know, given certain background and uh, identification, that I wouldn't notice much difference between being in Germany in 1939 or being in the United States in 1939. I will argue, and I think you agree with me, that if you weren't a particular ethnic group, you probably uh, are on one of the bad ethnic group lists, including the ones that were rounded up in this country. Uh, you probably wouldn't notice that much difference between the amount of fascism in the United States in 1942 and the sense of massive government controls, regulations, conscription, and mass slaughter, and that in Germany in 1942. And so I'm saying on those grounds, yeah, the state's a state. And who cares which of, the, of its various ugly faces it decides to uh, turn to me. I guess I would summarize that as, <laughs> as saying that Dave seems to feel that Sam has unfairly characterized Bob as an agent of the state and feels, feels that there's a lot more gray uh, as opposed to black and white. So I guess we're down to questions of photographic chemistry here, Sam. That will be right up your alley. Well, I was warned to quantum. But anyway, um, okay, as far as I, I thought, of course, uh, I was trying to be as fair as possible to, to uh, Bob. And, of course, he's fortunately here to defend himself, so I, I don't feel too put upon there or that I've been putting upon him either. Uh, uh, and I'll hand this microphone to him as soon as I finish so that he can immediately jump in and point out otherwise. I'd like to point out, though, that I can never remember agreeing to, to a world of gray. I definitely do believe in, uh, in black and white. We're the black and the enemy is the white. And uh, we're the blacks, libertarian historical color, and just like communists are reds. And, uh, yeah, I, I think that's, that's a fact. Um, as far as what does that mean uh, once we get away from green bow ties and other symbolism, you know, people are at any given time unless they work at you know being consistent not everybody does not everybody even realizes it's valuable to be consistent so that you don't contradict yourself all the time uh, a lot of people have mixed premises but each of those pre premises the, the way you say it's mixed is because some of those premises are right and some are wrong sometimes they apply them some of the time sometimes they uh, other time that doesn't mean that doesn't mean gray in the sense uh, that at least a lot of people mean it if you want to say a speckled uh, color appears from a distance fine uh, I think what I'm trying to get at here, then, is uh, to get a, a, an answer as close as possible and as short a time as possible here. Yeah, I think that libertarians or anybody else, when they're dealing with a problem, have to separate out the elements which solve the problem and the elements which uh, don't. And I hate to sound like a utilitarian, since I do believe in natural law and I do believe in natural rights and all the rest of those wonderful uh, but atheistic moral codes. Um, they're all there. and. Um, I think the rhetoric uh, that's involved with that is useful, if nothing else, to generate some emotions, which we ought to have at times, too. Uh, that that's covers a lot of it, uh, of what you were asking. Um, the last thing I would guess is this. The statement of whether or not somebody serves the state or doesn't serve the state is, is crucial to deciding libertarian tactics and strategy on the grounds. How you deal with that is interesting. 
that, in fact, is almost a totally untouched upon subject here because we're debating on whether or not it's an important issue. Uh, some people here, again, Murray's not in the room, but some people, shall we say, close to Murray, who have, have in fact implied something like class liquidation, which was used earlier in, in the rhetoric, uh, actually sounding like they put people up against the wall and shoot them. Others of us have uh, decided that the proper way is a combination of market uh, uh, activities, of uh, educational activities, and uh, even at the time, social shunning is, uh, is, a, is a useful one. It uh, cuts both ways, of course, so use it accordingly. Uh, yeah, I think that we have a, a, a core position. I think uh, we are black to a large extent in following it, and I believe we ought to use things to reinforce it, and I believe there's a, a need and a use and a value to each and every one of us as individuals for having a collective movement. To even go back to the previous question. And now I'm going to give. Uh, right. I believe you said define this time libertarianism as opposed to libertarian. Um, again, I, I'll tell you, in a sense, it's a synthesis of what I've been saying before because I think the, the uh, label is, is mutating. Uh, it's a rapid or a growing organism. Perhaps it's had a little gene splicing, I don't know. But uh, libertarianism means, uh, to me at this point, is an umbrella term. It has to be if, uh, if uh, Bob and I and Dick are standing up here or sitting up here. Uh, so it must be a pretty wide umbrella with a large, uh, large uh, covering area and, uh, to keep us from the state. And the question is, is that more useful than not? I think uh, we really get down to it. Um, at times, Bob obviously doesn't find it useful. He decides not to use the label at all. And uh, I, think, I, I think I understand his reasons. They're, they're, uh, they fit with pretty much the philosophies outlined here to accomplish certain ends. It doesn't... It's better for him not to wear a label, fine. I find the uncomfortableness going in the other way because uh, part of the time it fulfills what I remember way back to the definition one and definition two. Libertarianism is, I think, moving towards the, the point of definition one, which is simply all-inclusive of all these people who simply uh, prof profess liberty. And unfortunately, you know, FDR professed liberty, except that he also wanted a big welfare uh, safety net. And uh, Lyndon Johnson professed to love liberty as his highest value, except for, of course, a massive intervention of people in South Vietnam and so forth. Uh, I think we, the, the, the umbrella will stretch, might eventually stretch to the tearing point, and then some of us will want something else to uh, protect ourselves from the acid rain of statism, if I can complete the metaphor. Um, I think that's, that is what libertarianism at this point I think really does mean, and so in, in a sense I don't think we're out that far apart. We may want different things, but I think we're, beginning, we're seeing the same thing. I'll second that one, I guess. Uh, Michael is asking, what is a limited government, and isn't that a contradiction in terms? I, I assume he's asking Bob, since I'm perfectly willing to agree with that. <laughs> and that concludes our debate. Thank you very much for your kind attention.